some internet issues, myself included, based on this uh, difficult weather we're having. Okay. So today's lesson is about natural selection. It is November 12th, 2020, and today is Unit 8, Day 3. By the end of today, you all will be able to explain how natural selection influences the changes in species over time. And our central question, how does natural selection influence evolution? So this is really a, a pretty fascinating topic. We could talk a lot about it, but we're going to we're going to present the basics today and you all will have an opportunity to continue to explore based on the uh, one of the activities we have for the asynchronous portion of class. Okay. So natural selection, we can see natural selection in action just by looking all around us. It's a pretty fascinating occurrence, phenomenon. But I want to know what you all already know about natural selection. What's your, what's your background knowledge? Natural selection is basically survival of the fittest. Say that again. You're kind of breaking up a little bit. Um, natural selection is basically survival of the fittest. Yes, that's another way that we talk about natural selection. We call it survival of the fittest. Good. Anybody know anything else? Um, it can occur in different environments. Excellent. Yeah, natural selection can occur in any number of environments. They could, it can occur in a marine environment, you know, in the ocean. It can occur, occur in a uh, temperate environment, like the one that we live in here in Charlotte. It can occur in a desert environment. So we see it all around us. Um, can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Natural selection can occur in many different ways. A excellent. Yeah, natural selection can occur in in many different ways, and it can be caused by any number of uh, any number of things. Sometimes it really is totally random. Uh, sometimes it's caused by a natural disaster. Sometimes it's caused by the introduction of a new predator or um, a new food source. So good, you guys know a good amount. Anything else that we want to bring up? It's only possible through genetic variation. Yes, genetic variation is really at the root of natural selection. Good. Okay, great. So you guys know a lot. As Alicia said, we do also call natural selection survival of the fittest. Now, when we say the fittest, we're not, <clears throat> we're not necessarily talking about being able to lift the most weights or uh, being able to run the furthest having the greatest amount of stamina. We're not talking about fitness in that way. What we're really talking about is fitness in terms of reproduction. In this case, fitness or survival of the fittest describes uh, individuals who are able to have the most children. They're able to survive the longest. They're able to uh, pass on their genes to the most offspring. That's what we mean by fittest. So this process, natural selection, is the process in which organisms better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. The theory was first explained by Charles Darwin and is now believed to be the cause of evolution.
So we can see natural selection demonstrated in some of these images at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> Giraffes are a good case study of natural selection taking place, as are the finches, the birds, and the Galapagos Islands, which we'll talk about. And even, <clears throat> excuse me, even with our own species, Homo sapiens, <clears throat> we can we can think about what we call our most recent anatomical ancestors, or yeah, most recent common ancestor, MRCA. We can look at these most recent ancestors and see that uh, between us and many other species in the hominid family, um, we've got many anatomical similarities. Um, we've got behavioral similarities. We've got genetic similarities. And so the theory is that at some point, uh, you know, over 200,000 years ago, um, all of the species that have come out of the hominid family had a common ancestor. And because of this process of natural selection, because of um, geographic isolation, because of changes in food and changes in water and changes in energy sources, Many different species developed out of that common ancestor. So we'll talk about that process more. But this theory of evolution and, and, and um, this process of natural selection, which was theorized by Charles Darwin, came out of the Galapagos Islands. He traveled from England on a boat called the Beacon to uh, this archipelago, which is a series, a group of islands located near each other, right off the coast of Ecuador. And here he was able to discover many different species of birds and wondered how did all of these birds, all of these different bird species come so far from the mainland, from so far from the continent of South America? How did they all get here? Some of which he, he discovered didn't have the wingspan uh, that would have allowed them to travel such a great distance over, over time. So what he theorized was that many millions of years ago, when these Galapagos Islands were much closer to the mainland, there was probably a single species of bird that traveled to the Galapagos Island, that, that lived on these, this island, this group of islands. And that single species of bird evolved over time and uh, it, in many cases, became different species. They developed different beak sizes, they developed different wing sizes in order to allow them to compete for different resources. So I was going to, okay, let's see, let's come over here. Hopefully my internet can support this, but we'll see. Let's do a little exploration. So what continent is this that we're looking at? Hopefully you all know. Africa. Thank you, Castro. Yes, this is Africa. And Africa and its 49 countries. So I'm going to move west across the Atlantic Ocean. Now which continent am I, am I looking at? South America. South America, good. Actually, let me move north for first. So we can see the United Kingdom. This is where England is. This is where Charles Darwin is from. He was on a boat called the Beacon. Now at the time, well, let me, let me say, contemporarily, right now, we can, we can move from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean by going through Panama. The Panama Canal was constructed in the middle of the 20th century. And, you know, it allows boats to move directly through the country of Panama. Uh, it's a, that was a pretty big economic and social deal because it just dramatically decreased the amount of travel time. But uh, in Charles Darwin's case, he had to go from the United Kingdom all the way <laughs> around the bottom of South America and then up the western coast of South America.
to the Galapagos Islands. So just imagine that that was probably a, a three month long trip. Of course, they made some stops along the way in Brazil, they made some stops in Argentina, and then they get to Ecuador. But from the time of embarkment, of embarkment all the way until they arrive in the Galapagos Islands must have been months. A process that now, of course, you can fly in, in less than 48 hours. But we can see that these Galapagos Islands are, are not close really to um, Ecuador. You know, for a, for a bird, a, 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 a land-faring bird, not a seafaring bird, but for a land-faring bird to make it from Ecuador all the way to the Galapagos Islands just wouldn't be possible. Um, they would need to, you know, stop and rest and eat, but you can't do that over the ocean. So um, the theory came out of this idea that these Galapagos Islands were once, were once much closer to the mainland. Um, yes. Cool. So if the internet was a little better, we'd be able to explore a bit more, but I'll wait for it to load and we can come back to it after we make a, make more progress in our slides. The ancestors of these iguanas almost certainly lived in the jungles of Central America. There, still today, you can see iguanas in the trees overhanging the rivers, nibbling leaves, or on rafts of reeds. Just occasionally, are swept out to sea. And the vast majority, of course, die there. But just a few, a long time ago, were fortunate enough to be swept by favorable currents out to the ocean and pitch up here. In their ancestral rainforest habitat, iguanas are vegetarians. Here, they browse on juicy leaves. But the iguanas that first appeared in the Galapagos could find no such things. So these iguanas, to survive, had to eat the only kind of leaf that was available. Seaweed. And to get the best of that, they had to do something even more radical. They had to swim. They even learned to dive. They acquired the ability to hold their breath for up to an hour so that they could swim down to a depth of 20 meters. Their claws strengthened so they could cling to the rocks on the seabed. And under the water, they found an endless supply of seaweed, which grew in abundance in the nutrient-rich currents that flow around the islands. But that was not all. Their snouts became flatter to help them graze. And their teeth became sharper to grip the slippery seaweed.
one more video. It was pretty cool stuff though. It wasn't about the birds, but still cool. David Attenborough is a legend if you like watching those nature videos. This living laboratory of evolution helped to inspire Charles Darwin and continues to offer a unique opportunity to explore a pristine natural ecosystem. The Galapagos Islands are located 620 miles, or 1,000 kilometers, from the South American mainland, but a world apart from anywhere else on Earth. The archipelago and its surrounding waters, located where three ocean currents converge, are famed for the unique animal species found nowhere else on Earth, including marine iguanas, giant tortoises, flightless cormorants, and a diverse variety of finches. The islands have two airports, Isla Baltra and Isla San Cristobal, which are serviced by regular flights from mainland cities Quito and Guayaquil. As water temperatures change and seasons shift, different types of wildlife become more or less plentiful, so it's worth keeping a must-see species list in mind when planning your itinerary. All right, so clearly there's a great deal of biodiversity that is available on the Galapagos Islands. And so it was just a wonderful case study for Darwin and his, uh, his fellow scientists as they made their way through these, these islands. But sounds like you guys basically already have a good grasp of the causes of natural selection. And I do like that Alicia identified that genetics are a huge part of it, which is why we have our genetics unit immediately before we talk about natural selection. All species have the ability to reproduce exponentially. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around because um, we don't ever see that really taking place. Maybe if you think about an insect species or a rodent species, you can see some of that exponential um, reproduction taking place. So you, of course, you should be writing down the highlighted sections of these slides. Oops. So yes, species can, in fact, reproduce exponentially. But there's a limited amount of resources available in the ecosystem. So for those of you who are interested in this, the cool thing about our biology class is that we touch on so many different topics. But even within this class, there are many sub um, subtopics. So you know, we talked about our first unit was about micromolecules. Well, if you if that was what interests you, then you can study molecular biology, or you can study biochem biochemistry. Um, we talked about genetics. That is in and of itself an entire field of biology. Now we're talking about evolution and natural selection. So there's evolutionary biology. Um, so the cool thing about this is you get a, a taste of everything and you can really decide if, if anyone piques your interest more than the other, you can go and focus on that. But as we think about, um, as we think about these different types of reproduction, as I said, some species, well, all species have the ability to re reproduce exponentially. Um, the reason this doesn't happen is because every ecosystem has what's called a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity, and we use the letter K to represent carrying capacity. 
um, the carrying capacity of any given ecosystem is going to be different. Some ecosystems have a much higher carrying capacity than others. And this carrying capacity is based on the amount of abiotic resources that are available um, and biotic resources. And so the abiotic resources would be, what's the, what's the amount of water that's available? And is the water, water drinkable? Is it safe, healthy water? Um, what's the amount of sunlight that's available for the plant species? Um, what's, the, what's the salinity and the acidity of the soil for the plant species? So all of these things come into play. Even what, what's the air quality like in that ecosystem? Is it safe for organisms to breathe there? Um, all of these things come into play, but then also the biotic factors come into play as well. Are there other species that are available to be eaten in that environment? Are there insect species for you know um, the reptiles to eat? Are there reptiles for the mammals and the, the carnivores to eat? Are there ample grasses for the herbivores to eat? So the carrying capacity is going to be determined by all those different factors. And if this is something that interests you, there are scientists who literally study and, and quantify what the carrying capacity of all of these different ecosystems around the world is. And then when we think about the carrying capacity, we also have to think about there being different types of species. So an R selected species is a species that is going to reproduce at a young age and they are going to have the most, the most fit, the fittest organisms in this species are going to have a lot of kids. So we typically think of our selected species as being smaller, as being, uh, as having smaller brains or having smaller nervous systems, less developed nervous systems. Um, so we think of these as being like insects, rodents, uh, even rabbits to a certain degree. And so these are selected species, they start re reproducing at a young age and their lifespan is much shorter, but they have a lot of kids. So their population size will blow up very, very quickly. As soon as they are introduced to an ecosystem, they're just going to explode in population size. But they explode way beyond the carrying capacity of that ecosystem. So they'll get to the point where there are so many individuals that there's just not enough food, there's not enough space, there's not enough air to breathe. And so quite a few of them will die off and they'll die off so far below the carrying capacity that then this just happens again, they blow up again. And so we see this cycle in which the species uh, increases in size dramatically, but then decreases dramatically as well. And it just keeps going. Eventually it will start to level off at the carrying capacity. It's never gonna be exactly equal to the carrying capacity, but it will level off. With a K-selected species, these are the species we typically think of that are, have a longer lifespan. Um, they take longer to mature, so they don't, they're not able to reproduce for some years. Uh, they're typically larger, their brains, their nervous systems are more developed. So we can think of an elephant or a whale or a humans as being K-selected species. So their population size does not increase as dramatically, but it will increase over time. And it, it also will increase above the carrying capacity. And so with humans, this is an extremely important thing for researchers to be thinking about because we don't know exactly what our carrying capacity is on earth, but many scientists do suspect that we may have already surpassed it which means that there are too many humans on earth at this point. And if not at this point, then there soon will be. Our population is at about 8 billion right now. Um, and, and what these scientists are saying is that our earth is not likely to be able to support all 8 billion people. So at this point, we might already be at the point, the point in the curve where we are above our carrying capacity. Of course, that means that over time, uh, the population may have to drop in order for us to get below it, in order for us to now have resources to support the entire population. Um, again, some of that is speculation because we don't really know what the, what the specific carrying capacity of Earth is. But as a case-selected species, um, we, do, we don't see these dramatic increases and in, in drops below the carrying capacity. We're just gonna see it happen very gradually and slowly, and it's gonna continue to ebb and flow like that. All right, so 
that's not something you need to know, but I wanted to share that with you all for those of you who might be interested. Uh, because, what was that? I was saying that I had a question. Yes. So you know how some countries, they have a limit on how many children you can have? Is that because of the population? Uh, yeah, so China used to have a policy in which, you know, you weren't supposed to have more than one child. Uh, of course, this that policy is no longer in place, largely because uh, Chinese culture celebrates boys. It's a patri it's a it's a very patriarchal society, and so ch parents would have daughters, and then they would be legally, you know, unless they could afford to pay the fines or pay the permits to have another child, they would be legally bound to their one daughter. And so, unfortunately, what some parents would do because they wanted a boy. Um, they would kill their daughters. Um, and so, you know, the policy is no longer in place because it led to basically China's population is dramatically more male than it is female because uh, many parents, you know, would, would simply get rid of their daughters if, uh, if they, you know, if they weren't able to have another child. So that was, an, that was really an unfortunate, um, to put it lightly, an unfortunate policy. But Yes, that is ultimately why China did put that policy into place because their population was growing dramatically and it was outpacing the amount of resources that would be available um, to the citizens of the country. So rather than having to eventually deal with huge amounts of famine um, and huge amounts of water shortage, the, the government put into place this policy where people were not able, legally could not have more than one child unless they could afford to pay for a specific type of permit that would allow them to do that. Um, so it ended up, you know, backfiring pretty, pretty horribly, but that did exist. And I, I'm not sure if there are other countries that still have that policy in place, but certainly we do see that there, you know, Nigeria, for example, is a country whose population is still exploding. Um, and that's largely due to, well, that's due for, that's due to a number of reasons. But one of the reasons we might think about is the lack of contraceptives and the lack of knowledge of, um, contraceptives. So people are, uh, people are not practicing what we might consider safe sex and women are having many, many children. But of course, we're at the point in society where uh, it's less common that you will see a child die in childbirth. And so, you know, where in, whereas in the past, women might have eight births, but only four kids survive. Now they're having eight births and all eight are surviving. So the population is exploding. Um, and that is placing a huge strain, not only on Nigeria, but also on the region and also on the world as we try to find a way to feed all of those people. So it is a, it is a problem, um, especially in underdeveloped countries, but it's one that I think we will soon have to figure out. Okay, good question. So the fact that there is a limited supply of resources leads to competition for those resources. So individuals within the species will start to compete. And of course, individuals with specific traits are going to have an advantage. The faster individuals uh, will have an advantage. The Taller individuals will have an advantage. The smarter individuals will have an advantage. The stronger individuals will have an advantage. So depending on whatever resource is, is, is being competed for, specific traits will begin to provide an will begin to provide an advantage. And the individuals with that advantage, of course, have a higher chance of surviving. Now, of course, those traits come about just like as Alicia said, just as Alicia said, those traits come about because every population has some amount of genetic variation. No two individuals within a species is, are exactly alike. Everybody is going to be slightly different and have some different uh, advantages.
So that's where those advantages come from. We all have some genetic variation. No, but no two individuals are exactly the same. So once those organisms have the, uh, the advantage, they of course are more likely to survive. If you're more likely to survive, then you're more likely to reproduce. And if you're more likely to reproduce, that means that your genes are more likely to be spread throughout the population. Now, in some species, like the species we were talking about that reproduce very rapidly and at an early age, uh, this effect can be quite dramatic and it can take, it can happen quickly. An insect species, let's just say that there's an insect species. Um, half of the insect species is immune to a specific type of pesticide and the other half is not immune to it. So the half that's not immune dies before they are able to reproduce. The other half, or yeah, the other half is, the other half of the population that is immune goes on and is able to reproduce and each of them has a hundred children. So now you have, let's, let's, let's just say, you have thousands of children, all of which are immune to that pesticide. So very quickly within one generation, you totally change the genetic makeup of the population. Mr. Hood? Yes. What is it supposed to, um, in the little GIF thingy, what is it supposed to represent of the guy jumping in the computer? Yeah, so I think what this, this is kind of like an artistic speculation um, that human beings have undergone this industrial revolution. We've gone through this digital age. We're now entering the age of uh, AI, um, augmented reality and, aug and art artificial intelligence. And what this will mean is that we, there are actually some pretty cool developments that are showing that we, you know, the human experience is going to be simulated by computers very quickly. And some people will be able to live their lives almost totally digitally. So I think that's what this is getting at. But as genes are passed on, as the genes of the, uh, advantageous species or individual are passed on, they begin to accumulate within the population. And so this leads slowly to a change in the, in the overall population. What may have begun as just one or two individuals within a population of 100 having a specific trait, eventually those individuals are more likely to have kids. And then their kids are more likely to have kids. And those kids are more likely to have kids. So you see an ongoing change over time. That change over time is called evolution. Within the human species, uh, we have, you know, it, the theory is that we are evolved from a species that once lived in the trees. But because of competition for resources in the trees, some members of that species, some members of that population, decided to uh, move down onto the ground. They, start, they started to seek food on the ground. And because they were on the ground, they had to communicate more. They were in much more danger of, of predators. And so communicating more led to the development of, now this is just one theory, but the, the increased need for communication led to the increased need for some type of language system. And as the language system developed, 
the brain grew in size. And as that happened, at the same time, these that species started to walk on on two legs instead of on their hind legs, on um, both legs. They started to walk on their hind legs instead of on all four on all four legs. So you've got to imagine that this is taking place over many thousands of years. This is not a quick process. But the four components of natural selection are genetic variation, inheritance, competition, and reproduction. Okay, so we can see some of this genetic variation taking place here. Genetic variation is always present. All species have some amount of genetic variation. There are no two organisms that are exactly alike. We've talked about that ad nauseum. So we can see here, we've got, some, we've got this species of bugs. Some of the bugs are green, some of them are orange. The birds are eating the green, the green beetles. They have a preference for the green beetles. So what's going to happen here? The orange beetles are going to survive. Good, the orange beetles survive and then what happens? And they reproduce. Exactly. And what's going to happen when they reproduce? What's going to happen with their offspring? What color will they be? Orange. Yes, orange, thank you. So as all of the green bugs are eaten, it's gonna leave more of the beetles to be orange. Those orange beetles will reproduce and more likely than not, most of their, organism, most of their offspring will also be orange which means that the, the, for whatever reason, the birds won't like eating them. You can also think about competition. So in a lot of species, you know, there is a con there's a competition to reproduce. Females will only choose to reproduce with the stronger males. That means that the stronger males' genes are more likely to be passed on and their offspring are more likely to be strong. In this case, what do you all think was the environmental factor that caused changes in a bird species' beak shape? What caused these changes in these bird species' beak shapes? 
uh, I think uh, a change in their food source. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they had different food sources. They had different preferences for different types of foods. They had different avail. There was different availability for different types of foods. So rather than all, however many species this is, rather than all of these species competing for the exact same type of berry or the exact same type of insect or the exact same type of nut, they developed the abilities. They evolved so that each type of species has a different preference. Some of them have the ability to uh, live off of the nectar in plants. Some of them can live off of a specific type of insect species. Uh, some of them have beaks that are strong enough to break the shells of, of nuts and eat the nuts. So this just gave them a much greater access to the necessary resources that they didn't have to compete as much. And eventually those, bir those birds become different species. Okay. So most individuals of a certain species of bird have medium length tails, but tail length ranges within the species from very short to very long. If a new predator arrived that preferred to prey on birds with medium length tails, which graph describes the most likely result? So we've got tail length on the X axis, number of birds on the Y axis. So as we move down the X axis to the right, where the tails are getting longer. So long tails over here, medium tails in the middle, and short tails close to the x-axis. Of course, number of birds is on the y, I'm sorry, close to the y-axis. Number of birds is on the y-axis, so as we go up, we're saying that we have more birds. So which, which graph do we think would describe this result? Which graph would, would describe that result? If a predator comes in and starts eating all the birds with the medium length tails, which graph is gonna describe the result? Thank you, Alicia. Good. A. A predator comes in and starts eating all the birds in this part of the graph. They have the medium length tails. So what's going to happen is that not only do the short and long tailed birds survive, but they start reproducing more. And so more and more of the birds have shorter tails and more and more of the birds have longer tails. Eventually, we, we might see the medium length tailed birds go extinct and the short tailed birds and the long tailed birds might become two different species. So the study of peppered moths is an extremely useful study in conversations about natural selection. The study of pepper, peppered moss uh, is around, it's in the context of the Industrial Revolution. So what do you all know about the Industrial Revolution? It does a lot of pollution. Okay, there was a lot of pollution, yeah. What else do you know about the Industrial Revolution? What happened that caused that pollution? Factories. Yep. Like machinery. Yep. So there, were, there was an increase in manufacturing. You know, we created all these new technologies, these huge machines. Um, we built all of these gigantic factories in order to produce a lot more. The end results of that was a lot of pollution, just like Alicia said. But this affected the way that the plant species and the insect species in that specific ecosystem around the industrializing cities, they affected the way that those species lived. So before the Industrial Revolution, we can see that the peppered moss looked like this. They were largely white. You can see some black spots. 
but they blended in pretty well to the light colored trees on which they lived. During their industrial revolution and afterwards, the trees got a lot darker. And so the moss species came a lot darker as well. Let's think about that. So as you all said, the industrial Rev revolution, excuse me, represented massive increases in technology, massive uh, advancements in manufacturing abilities. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, there is huge amount of pollution. There are pollutants that were released because we're burning all of these non-renewable resources like coal and natural gas. So we can see that these chimneys are billowing out smoke and, and soot, and, and that's going to cover the landscape. It covers not only the buildings, not only the windows, not only the humans, but it also covers the trees and the surrounding landscape. So the trees that were before the Industrial Revolution pretty light in color, they became progressively darker. So you can see a moth right there. Before the Industrial Revolution, many of the moths would have been that color. They would have been basically white. Afterwards, they get darker. This graph kind of represents the changes in, uh, in moth color over time. Now this is for a light colored tree bark. This isn't for a darker colored tree bark like the Industrial Revolution. This is a light colored tree bark. So of course, like I said, genetic variation was always there. We always had some light colored moss and some dark colored moss. And they were always on a spectrum. But with each successive generation, as those moths have kids, have offspring, we see that there are fewer and fewer darker moths and more and more lighter moths. What do you all think caused the light colored moths to change color? Camouflage. Camouflage is what causes this. So they're trying to protect themselves from their predators. So the individuals that stand out on light colored tree bark are the darker colored individuals. And so they're much easier to see and therefore they get eaten. They can't have kids. Once you're eaten, obviously you're not gonna, you're not gonna reproduce anymore. The darker, I mean the lighter colored moths blend in, they cam they're camouflaged. And so they're able to survive and they have more opportunities to reproduce. They end up having more children, more offspring. And so the population shifts so that more and more, a greater percentage of the population is light colored. All right, now you don't need to, you only need to write down these definitions and I know we're about to run short on time. But some examples of evolution. So coevolution. this is when two, two species evolve together. This could be a symbiotic evolution, meaning that they are benefiting each other, or it could be a predator-prey relationship. The most common example of the predator-prey relationship would be the gazelle and the lion, or the gazelle and the cheetah. The cheetah is obviously trying to eat the, I'm saying gazelle, I should say gazelle. Um, the cheetah is obviously trying to eat the gazelle. <clears throat> and so the, the fastest cheetah is, is obviously able to catch up and eat the slowest gazelle. And so what happens is that the fastest gazelle survives and reproduces and now its offspring are faster. In order to account for that, the cheetahs have to get faster as well. So the faster cheetahs are able to survive. The slower cheetahs can't keep up. They're not able to ca catch up to the gazelles and so they starve and they die. They're not able to reproduce. So only the fastest cheetahs survive and they're still able to catch up to the fastest gazelles. But eventually the fastest gazelles have offspring that are even faster 
And so more cheetahs that are slower start to die off. And so you're in this constant competition. To get better. To get faster. Speciation occurs when uh, a new and distinct species evolves out of one species. And typically this is caused by geographic isolation. So there's typically going to be some type of physical or environmental barrier that leads to different species evolving. That might be caused by an earthquake that literally separates the land and so two species can't be, they can't, uh, they, two populations can't co-mingle anymore. Or it could also be caused by a drought or uh, a new river caused by flooding. So some type of physical barrier that separates the populations. Pangaea was probably, you know, the biggest cause of this separation, this, this physical barrier. There, you, there was once, we, th we, we theorized that there was once a supercontinent, and as that supercontinent broke apart and spread, spread throughout the planet, spread across the earth, um, species that were once close to one another were then very far apart. We see this because species that um, are very similar to one another and could not have evolved uh, from different, from two totally distinct species are located across the planet. For example, you've got African elephants and you've got Asian elephants. You've got North American crocodiles and you've got African crocodiles. So they, they, the theory is that they were once, you know, located near each other and then they got separated by the oceans as Pangaea broke apart. Right. So for ad time, sorry I ran over because I was edi editing the slides. There are two assignments. Uh, the Kahoot should be pretty easy. Obviously, both of the assignments will be due next Wednesday, so you've got six days to complete them. The Kahoot is just 20 questions. It should be pretty easy. You can do it on your own time. You can do it right now if you want to. Um, I can send the link to the chat now, but there is an assignment on Canvas to do that. Uh, and then the other assignment is a gizmo. The, all of the instructions for the gizmo are there for you all to read, um, but I can explain it in, in greater detail tomorrow. So I appreciate you all staying here with me. I'm going to stop the recording. You all are good to go.